Hi, everyone. I'm Lukas Chelström, and right coming directly from Finland. And I'm today going to talk about KubeADM and how it works under the hood, things like that. I'm an upper secondary school student and doing some cool stuff with Kubernetes upstream contributing to some SIGs and working on this, this year mostly on KubeADM and driving my own uh, company that is contracting for WeWorks and such things. It's nice to be able to, to contribute to this community. Uh, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, how Kubernetes, what Kubernetes is and how it fits into the ecosystem overall. What is the scope? Um, why does it exist overall? Uh, then getting a bit more deeper into how does the different Kubernetes components talk to each other? Um, how is the cluster secured? Uh, what is self-hosting and how can we benefit from using such a technique? Um, how does, like in 1.8, Kubernetes added support for easier upgrades? And so what does that actually do under the hood? And then how can AJ or high availability, someone could call it multi-master, how can that be achieved with Kubernetes as a building block? And well, this is a deep dive. I hope you'll enjoy it. Okay, so let's start with the Kubernetes, the scope of Kubernetes. What, what should Kubernetes do? Where, how does it fit into the ecosystem? Well, at, at the bottom, of the stack, we have some kind of infrastructure. It could be some of the public clouds shown here. It could be your bare metal cluster. It could be my Raspberry Pis on my desk, or what, 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 any, anything that has some machines. And then we're all here today, because we're excited about Kubernetes, I guess. Um, then we want to have Kubernetes installed somehow to our machines. And before KubeADM was created, this could, could be done, but it's, it's kind of hard. Or you could use some other end-to-end -to -end tool as well. Mm, so we created KubeADM that bootstrap Kubernetes. And it executes locally as a CLI tool on each machine. It only sees the machine it's executing on, like the file system, and other local resources, and the Kubernetes API above it. So what Kubernetes gets you is a Kubernetes cluster. It stitches the parts together and makes, it, uh, makes a best practice, but minimum viable cluster by design. So we, we don't install all the things for you, that's, uh, that's left up, up to the user to layer three. That could possibly include things like cloud provider add-ons, uh, a thing we're currently wanting to extract out of core. Currently, cloud providers are built, eight or so, are built into the core, but that has some severe uh, limitations. So we're actively trying to move those out to run as normal controllers on top of Kubernetes. Or it could be load balancers or monitoring, logging, whatever is still. Um, but that's left up to the user. And then we have a new exciting um, API coming up, an API spec called the Cluster API. You might have seen Robert Bayless and Chris Novas talk earlier today about on this topic. If you didn't, you can check out, check the, the recording out on YouTube in the coming weeks. Uh, the cluster API is a declarative way of specifying what should my cluster, cluster look like. I can say things like, I want the control plane configured like this, and then I want a machine set of these N nodes running on this cloud or whatever. And then we have some so the spec is generic, but then we have a, in, an implementation that is cloud-specific or environment-specific that is running on top of Kubernetes 
and reconciles to create these nodes and or masters. So Kubeadm is a tiny part in this ecosystem. There's a lot of different, uh, a lot of moving parts, but Kubeadm is this like turtle at the bottom that does its thing, executes locally, and has a very small scope to just do the minimum viable thing needed for a cluster. People often ask me, what is the difference between Kubeadm and COPS? Are they competing? Which is better? Which are, things like that. Uh, they aren't competing, as they have totally different scopes. Kubeadm, as said, only executes locally on the master, has a very local view of what's happening. But COPS has this global view of the cluster and manages the infrastructure, all the machines, bootstrapping Kubernetes, and add-ons as well. So there are two totally different things and should be used in, by two different kinds of users. If you just want a cluster up and running on AWS or GC or whatever, uh, and want everything, like just one command to do all the whole cluster for you, then COPS is your thing. If you want to build your own Terraform, whatever, bootstrapper on bare metal or your custom something, then QBDM might be your better, a better choice. So what are the key design takeaways with QBDM? Well, when we started this effort one and a half years ago or so, we decided it should set up a best practice cluster for you. And it should have, as I said, a very small scope. The user experience should be simple and the cluster reasonably secure. Uh, for example, we, you can add nodes with this token to, to Kubernetes join, which is a trade-off between security and simplicity. You, can, you, you, can, you don't have to use the token. You can use other ways as well, like copying over a file from the master to the node. And it's intended to be a building block. Kubernetes in it does a lot of things, which we'll see in a minute. And you can run these separately as well. It's, it, Kubernetes doesn't care about how the kubelet is run. So we do provide package deb and RPM packages. Siglaster Lifecycle provides those uh, for you. But if you want to run Kubernetes on like CoreOS or Rancher or whatever other OS that doesn't use Debs and RPMs, you feel free to run the kubelet yourself uh, and everything will just work. The, it's only a template. Uh, then we made a design decision that we should not favor any specific provider like Flannel or Weave or Calico or something like that. Instead, we chose to not do, do such things, and it's up to the user to install the CNI network via a kubectl apply. So that also has a consequence that if you run kubeadm in it only, you won't get a working cluster, as there is no networking. The kubeadm architecture is composable, and everything's divided into phases, as we'll see in the coming slide. Who's the Kubernetes audience then? Who should use Kubernetes? Well, a lot of users are happy with this Kubernetes init flow. They're typing into the command line, then joining nodes as they go. And this is a great way to get started to Kubernetes. Start like tinkering about like with how it works, seeing all the API server running, things like that. Or it could be used in an automated manner by tools like COPS or Kubicorn, or whatever. So here is the high-level component architecture for Kubernetes. We have the master, which is an API server, which is stateless. Uh, basically a REST API in front of etcd. Then what makes Kubernetes Kubernetes is the controller manager, which runs a dozen, dozens of controller loops to make sure the desired state is the actual state and reconcile on that. Then we also, when, when you create a deployment, for example, 
the controller manager will create replica sets and in turn pods as a consequence. And then the scheduler will kick in and bind these pods to a node, which will then trigger the kubelet to run the container image of your choice using the container runtime, which will well, then execute on your host. And we have the, all these beautiful interfaces with CNI, CRI, OCI, etc. So Kubernetes Minute does a lot of things. The first thing it does is generate the needed certificates. Um, they are a couple. We have the root CA cert, which is the, the boundary of trust for the cluster. Uh, from that root CA cert, the API serving cert is generated with, with a year's valid, uh, and it's valid for a year. Then we have the kubelet client cert. So we'll, we'll see in a later slide that the API server, when calling, when you're calling kubectl logs or kubectl exec, you're talking to the API server, which then is talking to the kubelet. Um, and then the API server needs uh, some, some kind of credential to talk to the kubelet. Then we have a service account private key and some things needed for API aggregation support. Then we, have, we generate some identities for the initial actors in the cluster. Um, for example, the kubelet client cert or a cert for the admin or for the KCM and scheduler. So far, so good. Then we host a CD. You could do this externally as well. I mean, that's probably preferable. Um, but then the easiest way is using a static pod and letting the kubelet host it for you, or basically babysit it. Um, then we have the API server, controller manager, and scheduler running a static pods in from that Etsy Kubernetes manifest directory. The running kubelet will then start these static pods and will have the control plane up and running. Then kubeta marks the initial node to be schedulable with this uh, label or key value pair. And it also taints the master to not schedule workloads there by default. So, and this is because of security boundaries. You shouldn't really run normal workloads on your master, as that might lead to privilege escalation pretty easily as well. Um, hence, we have the taint so that your, your normal workloads won't schedule on the master. Then the first QBedM specific thing is that QBedM will upload the configuration, the internal uh, state of the world to a config map, so that later when upgrading, it will know what is the current state of the world and act based on that. Lastly, we create a bootstrap token, so you can, add, you can use the QBedM join functionality to authenticate to the master when, when adding this node and then deploy the mandatory add-ons in order to co pass conformance tests. So that is, that is the current bar of QBedM. QBedM should create a cluster that makes it possible to pass the conformance test, but nothing more. I mean, there's various other things like Heapster, or, which is now metric server, or some logging solution, or whatever other thing that is normally used in Kubernetes clusters should be installed by the user themselves or this higher level solution. And one thing is, one cool thing is core DNS support is now alpha in 1.9. You can enable that with a feature gate. But if you don't want to do all these things at the same time or in <clears throat> like this full meal deal, you could run these phases as we call them, these atomic Substeps of cluster creation. You could run them separately. Generate the cube configs, certificates, the control plane static pod manifest, 
and etc. Or you could, if you have some good replacement or don't need, for example, the bootstrap token, you can just don't do that and do everything else and provide some other, like copying over the file, the credentials from the master to the node instead. So what does a, like, in a TLS secured cluster, how do these components talk to each other? With what credentials and so forth? Well, we have the API server, which serves on HTTPS by default 6.4.3. And we have this kubelet client cert, as I talked about. Then we have the other components with their uh, certificates that have, have to have this, uh, like for the controller manager, for example, it has to have the CN of System Cube Controller Manager in order for it to be able to pass that, well, have the right RBAC privileges. Of course, if you have something else, you have to assign, you have to create a cluster role binding between the normal, <coughs> well, the, the controller manager privileges and the cert. The controller manager runs two, in this case, uh, significant controllers, which are the CSR signer and the CSR approver, which we'll see in action a bit later. And a CSR is a certificate signing request. Then we have the initial master node. And now we're about to join the second one. Uh, we're now basically typing in kubedm join with, with the token. The kubelet will start with a self-signed HTTPS server. This is still an area to improve. This is basically true for all Kubernetes deployments right now, that the kubelet cert is often self-signed. Um, as we go, hopefully this feature will graduate to beta next cycle in 1.10, so that it can use the same cluster CA. Um, but as that is work in progress um, with Sigurd. So we give kubedm the bootstrap token, and it will figure out the trusted CA, which, it, which the kubelet uses to talk to the API server. We'll then get a CSR with node, uh, node two, which then the CSR approver will automatically go ahead and approve. If you don't want this link, uh, you can disable it. It's just an RBAC rule. But by default, in order to have a smooth flow for you when you're joining nodes, the CSR approver automatically approves, which the CSR signer then signs. So that means we have the CA key on the master. We never give away the CA key anywhere. And then we have a single we, we have this reconciliation flow where we just post these requests and whoever has the CA key can then go ahead and sign them. This is also true for external CAs, for example. One common request with kubedm is I have some kind of corporate policy that I don't get access to the CA key or I can't move it on cluster. How can I mitigate that and still use kubedm? Uh, well, the answer is you run kubedm face certificates and kubeconfig, which will give you all the required identities while you're having the CA key. Then you're, you, you'll just go ahead and copy everything by, but the CA key to the cluster and run this CSR signer somewhere else. That will give you the same effect. So cool. Now we got the, the client cert for the node, for the second node. And, we ha and its identity is unique. Then we have an auth another auth feature introduced in 1.7, which is the node authorizer, which will make it, which scopes down the kubelet privileges to only what it actually runs. So when, the cube, when you type in kubectl logs, the API server is gonna insecurely or uh, unverified connection to the self-signed HTTPS server. So the, this request is using HTTPS, 
but the API server can't be sure that the kubelet is the one that it's actually uh, pretending to be. But this is a uh, work in progress, and contributions welcome, as always. Um, then when the kubelet gets this uh, call, or gets any call, it will send a subject access review request to the API server, asking, is this actor, now the kubelet client, authorized to call my API? Basically, it's, it's asking, is this person who is trying to access my API root in the cluster? And in this case, yes. In other cases, no. So in 1.4 and 1.5 and earlier, uh, most clusters didn't secure this kubelet API bit, which essentially made it possible to exec. If you could ping any node, you could exec in to that node because there were, there were no authentication in this step. But as of kubeta and 1.6, this is all secured. Okay, let's move on to self-hosting. What does it mean? Well, we're using Kubernetes primitives to configure and host the control, control plane itself. And this, was in it, this concept was developed by CoreOS and has been vetted in the Bootcube project. Now we're working, the C++ lifecycle team is working on upstreaming this kind of functionality into kubeadm, into this building block that kubeadm is. So you can still run your cluster using static pods, but the chances are you might want to use self-hosting because it leads to easier upgrades eventually and stuff like that. There's also another self-hosting talk tomorrow by Diego from Chorus. Make sure you check that out. And so how is a self-hosting cluster created? That's kind of opaque to many people as well. Um, here is a sequence diagram, how it works. Uh, there's quite some detail as well, but this is a deep, uh, deep dive, so I guess it fits in. Um, first, kubeadm has to know like what's the actual state, what's the current state. It figures that out by reading the local file system for the static pods. It then mutates these static pods a bit to work as self-hosted components. For example, tolerating the master taint is one thing. Um, and then it just goes ahead and creates the exact same, the nearly exact same resource in the API server. So you could pretend and think of it like, I'm running a new workload. It's an API server that should be run on my master. Um, then the API server is run, but it can't bind to the port. It's trying to bind to the 6443 port or whatever, um, but the, the, cell, uh, the static pod hosted API server already uh, listens to that port. So the self-hosted API server will cr go ahead and crash loop. When Kubernetes detects this crash loop looping, it will remove the static pod API server and the self-hosted one will come up cleanly. And now we have a state where Kubernetes can manage itself, which is kind of cool. And then Kubernetes does this for all components. And there we go. Upgrading clusters with Kubernetes. Um, we made it easy with Kubernetes upgrade plan and Kubernetes upgrade apply. Uh, these helper commands have a good UX and makes it straightforward to upgrade a cluster, but, and then hides the complexity under the hood. Um, in 1.8 one, one and 1.9, this basically shuffles around the static pods on disk um, and makes sure to, to catch edge cases um, and rollbacks. For example, if the 1.9 manifest doesn't come up cleanly, will roll back. Um, and, but then the promise is with self-hosted up, with self-hosted and AJ, we'll be able to like roll it out like any manifest. 
will we'll just edit the daemon set. It will uh, use the, the controller manager will roll out new pods as we go and replace the old ones. And if something fails, it will roll back itself. So uh, that is a cool thing. And in 1.9, we're also supporting automated downgrades. In a future release, we might look at runtime reconfiguration <coughs> or basically kubectl apply for a cluster. So let's say you started, uh, you started your cluster with some config uh, or the, like normal kubeta init. And then you, a week later or a month later, found out that I should actually have done this kind of thing. W but you have user workloads there and don't want to tear everything down. Then you could just do a kubetm upgrade apply with a new desired state of the world and kubetm will roll that out for you. Uh, we don't officially so support this yet because there are some parameters that could be dangerous <laughs> to, to reconfigure that will get into a weird state. Um, so we probably have to catch that, but Technically, it's already working and possible to do if you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so we have heard a, a user request that AJ would be nice to have. Um, and yes, it would. <laughs> The, the ideal flow here would be kubeta minute, then we get two tokens. We get one master token that we can use to add a master, and we get one node token as usual to add nodes. By definition, this means that the, the master token is equal to a, an etcd private key, to uh, etcd write key. Um, and that is the thing like, you may ask yourself, is that production grade or is that secure to have a 22 char string um, able, like if, if someone else gets to know this 22 char string, then they'll have access to my etcd to like, can, can basically do anything. Um, so in order to achieve this, we have three primary challenges. First, we have to manage state, and this is probably the hardest one. How do we run a TD? Um, especially in a secure manner, um, with unique uh, identities, dynamic identities. Like, we could start kubeta a minute, run one master for a week, uh, add some nodes as we go, then a month later find out that, well, I actually want to have two masters, or then three masters or five. Um, so we, we can't know in, in beforehand what will the desired cluster state look like. Instead, we have to dynamically reconfigure, which is challenging. Um, then sharing and rotating the common certificates between all masters is another challenge. Uh, we have these, like for example, the service account pri private key has to be the same in all controller managers, otherwise, will get in a, into a weird state where pods will start erroring. Um, so these, these have to be like on all masters, but they also have to be rotated, rotated at the same time if we, or when we rotate things. Um, and then how should the kubelet be able to access, to address all masters dynamically? So we start with the one master, all kubelets talk to this one master, then we scale that up to three, and now suddenly they should be able to somehow discover all three masters. Um, in a secure way, to be added. Well, you can achieve kubetm AJ today. Um, and that is one of the most common misunderstandings which I'm glad to clarify here. If you run your own etcd AJ cluster to start with, 
Uh, that might not be easy, but we'll provide documentation for the 1.9 release, what it could look like. Um, and you could build some, some kind of automation yourself, like Ansible, Terraform, or whatever. Then run kubeadmit on the first master, copy over the shared certificates to the second one, run kubeadm in it again, and do the same for the third one. So basically, or you could pre-generate all certificates and just distribute them to all masters. That might be preferable. Then some kind of external load balancer. It could be a cloud load balancer or a DNS server or something like that. Just to make the kubelets address all the masters dynamically. Or statically for might also work. And then the API service should talk to a TD. So this is all doable. And as I said, we'll provide documentation for you how to do this. There's, there are more commands to, to execute than a kubeadm join dash master. But at the same time, it takes a lot of, a lot of pain away from you anyway, because if you're about to, to do or create a normal AJ Kubernetes cluster, there's a lot of things Kubernetes already does for you, as said here, with, with things like certificate generation and uh, control plane spec generation with good defaults, etc. So this is going to be documented. Then one possible solution to create this kubedm join dash dash master flow could be this. Um, we're using the kubelet as the babysitter sitter for all components. Uh, Self-hosting the API server and controller manager scheduler in daemon sets. Using, putting all the cluster certificates in secrets and having self-hosting etcd on top. Uh, this is extremely challenging, though, and hasn't been proven to work. Uh, so I mean, this is one idea that we could do. Uh, but And then use something like Envoy as a daemon set to address Envoy as a proxy to address the masters. Um, in the meantime, we, we might do something in between that you can do kubedm aj, but you still have to set up etcd externally. And we'll do the other two parts for you, or whatever. But as kubedm has this local scope, it's really hard to, uh, not, not the global scope, and, and, that it, and that it would know of all machines. It's very hard to achieve this kubedm join dash dash master flow just like that. Um, but join the cluster lifecycle, and you'll, you'll be a valuable resource for us to spec this out. Is it possible? In, in that case, how? If it isn't possible with one command, maybe two or three. And yeah, that was my talk. Uh, I'll post the, or this presentation is posted on SCAD. So you can check it out there and look at these links. And yeah, let's talk about this in C class lifecycle and continue to improve QBDM to GA, GA and beyond. Any questions? We have one minute. So uh, as an alternative to HA, sometimes it feels like um, it, it would be nice to just like have a snapshot of its CD, and if something goes bad, I'm like, oh, panic, and I kind of restore with that. Uh, would, is it easy to get QBDM to do that, or is that not at all the right direction? I think using Heptio Arc or something similar will, would be useful there, or, or a dedicated backup tool. Uh, of course, you could etcd ctl 
snapshot or yeah, whatever. As assuming I have the backups, yeah. like it, let's say I have a backup of, of each CD and I'm yeah. like in panic mode and I try to revive my dead Kubemaster, can I use kubedm for that or am I using the wrong hammer on the wrong nail? <laughs> I would, I haven't thought through it, but spontaneously I would say you should use another tool. Okay, thanks. That is how the code. Can you use um, kubeadmin to manage existing clusters? Let's say if I have an existing production Kubernetes cluster which is not created or managed using kubeadmin, can I use kubeadmin to take over that? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, okay. I mean, it all depends. If you happen to use the nearly the same semantics, maybe, but there are so many parameters that that's pro virtually impossible. <laughs> Go. Yeah. Uh, so, Cube ADM has a, had a slide uh, uh, where you can do everything in phases. Yeah, the, right? the phase functionality is there since 1.8. So, and unfortunately, now, now time's up, so we'll have to. <laughs> Okay. You, you can come and talk to me after this. And also, we're going to host a C Cluster Lifecycle in person meetup at the Taco Project at Hilton, in Hilton Austin just right now after this. So feel free to come and talk to us, C Cluster Lifecycle guys, after this. Thank you.